Hi, everyone. I'm sure you're all willing this session to be ended so that you can go back to home or whatever. <laughs> so let's start. Um, so sit back and relax. And this is all about TV. This is a nice topic for once. At least that's what I think. Uh, so make yourself comfortable. Uh, not too comfortable, though, right? <laughs> uh, quickly, we decided to split these presentations into four parts. Uh, first, we're looking at what we do as media kind and, and what we why we notify that uh, building cloud native solution is relevant for our industry. Uh, unfortunately, it's not a, a, an easy journey, and we'll come back to the challenges and how we overcame, overcame <coughs> sorry, that challenges. If we have time, and at the end of the day, the, the session, just to keep you here, we'll show you a presentation, a demo of the 360 uh, sport videos. Um, moving on, my name is Arnaud Caron. I'm French, as you can tell. Um, I'm in the media industry for more than 15 years uh, now through multiple uh, leading companies, uh, starting from development, architecture, and product management. I'm now driving the cloud transformation of the company portfolio. I am uh, Jérôme Champetier. I um, have been also in the world of television for about 15 years. Uh, started working on TV appliances, writing Linux drivers, uh, all exciting stuff. Um, you did since probably Linux 2.6. Uh, and now I'm a senior technology architect uh, working on anything related to cloud and Kubernetes. Thanks. Um, so quickly on the overview of uh, MediaKind, we are a global leader uh, company in the media space. And we have a large focus on R&D, as you can see uh, across the globe, at multiple locations for R&D centers. Um, we are hiring as well, by the way. Um, our customers are the mostly network, TV, services operators, everyone that is doing TV uh, in the world today. You have some indicative number on the bottom right. I'm not really going into that now. Um, I would say that in summary, if you guys watch a live TV, events, sports, on demand, OTT, something, there's very big chance that somehow the video feeds, the data feeds, has been through the media kind of software at some point or hardware at some point. Okay, get, getting into the, into the flow, what it means, um, we start from the uh, capture devices, the source, the cameras. If you're familiar with this, you know about this. They are deployed in the, in the venue, in the stadiums. Um, what we aim at doing is to deliver that videos down to the various uh, displays, TV, set, phone, tablets, whatever. And what we do is that we operate in the middle, the stream ingestion, the decoding, the processing, storage, distributions, services, and so on. Um, for for the um, for the TV, and that enables a large variety of uh, uh, use cases: live TV, replay TV, uh, on-demand ex video experience, and so on and so forth. Just a bit of uh, context on the industry where we are coming from. I think it's important to understand the the, the, the transitions we are making as part of this industry. I'm not going to talk about John Baird, which is the inventor of the TV back in 1929. I think we don't need to do that. But I just want to illustrate this, that we have industry has a big roots into the electronic science and not really into the computing and the software technologies. Mm -hmm. and that's very important to understand because ultimately this is one of the reasons why we take some time to do this kind of transitions. To set a bit the scene on the challenges for years and years, uh, we mostly focused on the performance. We were trying to increase our quality of services, in this case, video services, in, and squeezing the more and more TV channels into some network, uh, constrained networks with limited power, um, not compromising on the very high reliability that we expect in the industry. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't care much about the flexibility of the solution, <laughs> so that was a bit of an issue, but that's okay. And we didn't care about running on standard IT equipments. Um, mostly quality was the, the, main, the main focus. As you can guess, this is changing now. Um, the main changes came up in the last, uh, last few years. So probably you know about Netflix, about Amazon Prime, about YouTube TV. You surely have uh, some of those applications on your smartphone today. Um, this is called OTT. OTT stands for over the top. Uh, delivery. Basically, it means distributing uh, media and streaming services directly to the viewers on their devices. 
uh, on top of <laughs> uh, different on top of the networks that are deployed by your network operators, whether it's a physical line at home, a DSL line, or a wired line uh, up in the air, 4G, 3G, whatever. Um, although, unfortunately, these uh, network operators were using to bundle the TV services with the network services, they were able to get monies and bundle subscription package based on this. Uh, this is a big issue for them because now we have this new competition coming into the market, getting fast on the market, and actually using their network pipe and reducing their, our, our customers and the pay TV operators to a pipe provider delivering only the networks, not delivering the services anymore. This is one of the, the, the high pressure that we get on in this industry. The other one is, uh, is actually you, it's actually us, the consumer. We change the habits. We heavily changing our video consumption habits in the last year. Um, as you can imagine, uh, we all have these TV applications on the phone and the reason is that we want to be able to watch TV on the go, in a train, um, in the street. Maybe someone is watching TV right now <laughs> in this session. It's a bit boring. Um, we want also, uh, we don't want anymore to watch TV in the couch at home. That's not the only usage. We're going really beyond that. Uh, at the same time, we want to be able to watch TV anytime. Anytime meaning not necessarily exactly when the show is on air. I want to play this whenever I want. I want to do uh, video on demand. I want to do a subscription video on demand as well as a cool features versus watching TV when it's on air right now. Of course, you still have the live sports events that are very relevant for on air timing uh, deliveries, but for everything else, the series and so on, no one is watching that anymore live stream. Um, the last point is that we are also requesting a personal experience. You know about these Netflix features like, because you watch this, I would like to get access to this. That's a new way to get more content, more relevant content individually. So how this, uh, this industry, how do we adapt to this? Year? Why do we go to Cloud Native ultimately? So on our side, four years ago, we start uh, looking at removing, removing these barriers related to the flexibility. If I summarize it, this is all about flexibility. And Jerome will go into details about that in a, in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> the first and the important barriers is the infrastructure. Um, media domain traditionally care about building their own hardware, their own appliance, as we call it, their own broadcast and video physical links, connectivity, um, even their own chipsets for processing, not using the standard CPU, but building their own chipsets. Coming back to the roots and the electronic science. Um, to move to the next level, we need to be able to use off-the-shelf hardware. We need to be able to use a private public cloud, hybrid cloud data centers. This is the only way to move forwards and get unified uh, management and tool sets. Besides, uh, we also need to deliver uh, new services click at the internet speed so this is all about uh, operations as you can see up there in the past we were doing the configuration changes into the front panel just typing some buttons and having this small LCD screen to change the configurations of the device this is not possible this is not flexible this does not help us at all uh, we want to be able to operate faster have agility move applications uh, focus on the implications and not focus on the infrastructure anymore um, at last, yeah, we're trying to be efficient in terms of uh, finance, money. This industry is trying to get some money out of that stuff. Um, so we need uh, to adapt to the business model, the commercial model, and the flexibility, and we need to do some savings. In the past, this was not really a constraint. It's getting well more a constraint now. Um, going a bit, uh, a bit deeper, um, we have multiple types of workloads, and that's why it's a bit important to understand this difference versus the traditional um, uh, e-commerce or websites that we can see everywhere here and the foundation of these cloud-native solutions. Uh, we have some traditional, transactional sorry, um, uh, use cases and workloads. Uh, typically, when you log on to watch your TV, to get your portal, to get access, to sign up for an SVOD services and so on, there's a portal here. This is running in the cloud doesn't matter, that's a transactional service. It's typically uh, something that the cloud native solutions and Kubernetes are doing very, very well today in terms of scalability and efficiency. The second workload is more uh, the flow-oriented one. Here we talk about 
uh, live TV, uh, typically live TV, something that Kubernetes and the others are not really less, are not really good at, and we need to adjust, I would say, in our solutions. Um, we have pretty high constraints on the networks, as you can see in terms of bandwidth, in terms of latency. Um, we use mostly stateful applications in this case, because when you do a live encoding, you cannot stop the encoder, otherwise you don't have TV anymore. Um, and we have a high uptime and high reliability request as well. Again, we don't want to stop TV. It's not, this is not an option. The third workload is more about the storage. Typically, when you press record on your remote control, then something is recorded, so either it's locally. Now, most of the time, it's up in the air in the cloud or in data center or somewhere, so that you can play back this recording at another time in your train or here at KubeCon, as I mentioned uh, earlier. This is called Cloud DVR Solutions. Cloud DVR request, uh, requires sorry, a lot of petabytes of data that needs to be accessible instantly wherever you are located. Again, Kubernetes and the ecosystem is not very great as did this either. <coughs> um, to build a TV service, we need three workloads working together. Um, in different data centers, same data centers, we need the flexibility for this. Um, handing now to Jerome that will go into more details about, uh, about this and how we change. Thank you. So, as I was saying, it's really important to understand that all these workloads have got to work together because when you watch television, you want all of this stuff to work together. You, you want to press record to watch, to watch your particular uh, live TV broadcast later and so on. So that's quite an important point. Um, uh, over the last couple of years, really, we've the first part of my work has been to transition the whole of the uh, live TV portfolio we've got uh, over the, to the cloud. And that's just not Kubernetes, it's cloud in, in general. So um, really, I think what's happened is where the content was produced before. So it will be large sports broadcasters, it will be uh, news studios, it will be uh, movie studios. First thing they, they, they now start to considering doing is actually push everything to a storage in the cloud or a particular uh, production uh, facility somewhere, hosted somewhere in, in, in either a, a private cloud or public cloud. So uh, really that's really what we call contribution networks or production networks of really moved to the cloud. And uh, the bits on the right there is, um, is to do with access networks, is to do with what you and me use to watch television on either your mobile phone or uh, your home broadband or uh, your cable or your cable television subscription type. So uh, that also is now we call we call that the cloud downlink more and more um, uh, as opposed to being a uh, an access network. So that's really quite a, um, a progressive change. And I'm going to take you through the technicality of that change. Um, so um, that's about a, yeah, probably a couple of years ago, three three years ago already. Uh, we started looking at. Uh, taking our appliances, uh, taking our monolithic software, and like most of you should know, cutting into the microservices and trying to package it and deploy it somewhat. Um, so we eventually adopted, uh, adopted uh, Docker as a way to build the containers uh, and deploy that above, uh, above Kubernetes. So uh, that's the kind of stack we support. We started, well, initially bare metal because our uh, software started first on servers. Um, uh, then we moved on to OpenStack, um, played that with that a little bit, and then we now support all pretty much all public cloud providers. Um, uh, and same thing, so we have to change our, our application layer quite a bit, what we used to call our controller layer. We've, we've, we've had to adapt that to, to this new world. And that goes along with uh, analytics and monitoring, which I will talk about later. So that's in a nutshell. So what about infrastructure? So I'll make the point um, that Television started with more electronics as a really good point because we started, we, where I started really in, in that world is working on dedicated appliances where uh, we had specific uh, embedded processors with Linux on it, uh, which had one sole purpose was video processing or satellite modulation or satellite demodulation or terrestrial broadcasting, that kind of stuff. So these were dedicated appliances. They started connected via Ethernet for the control layer. But really, what we saw over time, um, uh, they started moving to more and more to integrated uh, into servers. So as you saw server uh, processing power going up, then they were able to actually take 
um, uh, take the kind of workloads we were doing on dedicated appliances where we had dedicated chips to do that. Now we see that more and more in traditional servers. Um, so it's an example of PC Express card. You, you, you can find it on the servers that we use for interconnecting with more broadcast networks, kind of a satellite demodulator and so on. Um, and then, of course, uh, like any businesses, uh, our customers, our TV operators or telcos, um, have business prerogatives, so they want to be more efficient uh, cost-wise. Uh, so they started pushing us to look, hey, guys, you should look at cloud like AWS or Google Cloud as a way to deploy your workload. So that's been a, quite a bit of an infrastructure change for us, um, going from purpose-built electronics to generic purpose um, infrastructure. So um, part of the infrastructure, which is important, is networking. So networking also, we did things our way. Um, we can see here a, a picture of all, uh, a coax cable with a lovely BNC connector at the back. Um, that was our network for many, many, many years. Uh, it's an example of uh, ASI or SDI, this special serial interface we use for televisions. Uh, they're still used today, unfortunately. We have to cope with that. Um, just to give you an idea about numbers, um, I think this was a, a 3G SDI, so that's 3 gigabits per second for one TV channel, one camera feed. Uh, 4K television moves to 12 gigabits per second, that kind of interfaces. And the 24 gig version is still in standardization, so it's not dying off. Um, we could still cope with it. Um, and of course, um, so that's for the, the high bit rate. And for the compressed kind of domain, a lot of the stuff has moved to IP, um, uh, where effectively people reused um, their typical um, switch uh, routers, uh, traditional Ethernet in, uh, infrastructure. Um, but what we found is more and more that um, the standards we used to find in the old classical world are moving toward the world of IP, which is, which is quite nice. Um, but uh, what we also see is that while that transition happens, we don't just forklift what we did in the appliance world, in the broadcast-specific world, and transition to IP. We are trying to make the most of IP. For example, these cables used to embed audio, video, and metadata in one cable, in one particular feed. Uh, with IP, you can imagine that everything splits in multiple essences. You can send the video to a particular production house, the audio somewhere, and the subtitles somewhere else again. So this, this kind of transition is actually beneficial for the whole industry. Um, but while um, we've done that, we're doing that progressively, by the way, and cloud brings its own set of challenges because, of course, you're dealing with public networks. Uh, you can have direct connections, I know, but it's still there's still some progression. There's still efforts to standardize how we do cloud uplinks, for example. Okay. Um, various open source projects are doing that, by the way. So when we transition from broadcast specific to IP, uh, as I said, we were trying not to forklift. So we trying to use IP as best as possible. And the way we did it is we trying to break away from some of the constraints we have in the old networks. Uh, so there's something called multicast. And if you don't know what multicast is, it's the ability for a sender to send one packet over the network, and that particular packet is replicated by the networks to all the receivers that subscribe to that feed. Uh, it's great. We loved it. Uh, we built entire broadcast plants that way. Unfortunately, when you go to containers, it doesn't work. So um, we, because most container networks, if you've been to some of the CNI talks, uh, uh, really the way the whole thing works is really unicast. And the reason why is because that is because containers initially were really defined and designed for dealing with uh, web transactions. Okay? That's the transactional architecture that really Kubernetes is really, really good at. Um, so yeah, that gives us a bit of a headache. So that means we have to uh, effectively, when we fire data to many, many receivers, we have to fire multiple versions of the packets in order to go across these networks. Uh, actually, that's not the only thing. We can also use what we, something we call CDN. So I think uh, you've, uh, you referred to Akamai. That's sort of the kind of type of CDNs that we use to get the content to consumers. So yeah, a bit of a headache. So uh, we have to convert flows. Bit of a shame, um, but we have to do it in order to get to these to this kind of networks. Um, 
So once you've converted flows, I mean, we also use various other mechanisms that we can also use TCP segmented type video as well. That's, I, I might uh, I'll probably, if I've got time, I'll try and explain that a little bit more about that. Um, so when we move to container networking, and this is actually very specific to Kubernetes, um, we started looking at uh, host networking. So the reason why, because it was really easy, uh, it's usually one line host networking true in your pod definition and you're done. Really? Good. Um, but that has a couple of drawbacks. Um, the problems we had with it is, first of all, um, if you know a little bit about node port, uh, sorry, about host networking, uh, if you have multiple pods on the same hosts and they open the same ports, you start clashing. So it's not ideal. Port clash is really not something that um, uh, really is handled really well. Uh, you end up having to be scheduled pods on different nodes and so on. It's just not, not ideal. Uh, and also because of the environment, you saw the diagram earlier about the cloud uplink and cloud downlink. Uh, so your sources, effectively, if, you, if your pods move hosts, the IP address of the pod, effectively, to the asset world changes. So you have to reconfigure your sources. So all the dynamic stuff just goes away. So it's just not ideal. So then we're trying to use uh, something called node port services, which is uh, another feature of, of Kubernetes. Uh, which is better because it means that your port, uh, if you don't know that, uh, it's the, uh, for that particular port is exported across all the nodes in your cluster. But the problem is uh, that the traffic is reforwarded to, the, to, the, uh, to a different node if the port you're trying to address is actually not there. So that's not great when we talk about the type of bitrace we were introducing you earlier. You know, that's not ideal. Um, and finally, uh, I think this comes a lot with many, many discussions with our, with our customers now. Um, we found that uh, in that case, um, forklifting the appliance way of working into Kubernetes might actually potentially work with multi-CNI, uh, with effectively multiple NICs. So we actually investigated that quite a bit. Um, and it does work quite nicely. So that means you have uh, your pod has got multiple interfaces, one for control, uh, which is your pod network your final calico and so on. And also, uh, you've got multiple NICs, which are related to data networks. So what we do is, very often in the appliance world, we separate the control traffic. So for example, the configuration, whether you want an HD or an SD channel, um, away from the actual video carrying network. So we normally have video networks that are dedicated for video. Uh, and the reason for that is because, of course, if you start having a lot of configuration, a lot of upgrades, uh, you start disturbing the video signal. And that's, not, that's really not good when you watch television, especially not live television. So um, that's really the um, kind of idea. It's still not there, frankly, because it is a journey, really. Because when you have multiple NICs, that means you have to deal with flow management. Uh, I know you've heard a lot of talks about Istio and Linkerd and so on. These are, to me, kind of flow management pieces. They're capable of uh, working out in a large cluster how to route traffic across firm services to services. services. We need a kind of service mesh for video, really. So there still is a, a, a journey for this. Um, so uh, Arno mentioned the, what we call OTT, over-the-top television, which is you carry television over someone else's network. Um, uh, an example of live television, this is an example of live television as systems as we deploy it today uh, on Kubernetes. Uh, so we take input sources, we send that to an encoder, which normally does compression. Uh, change the picture, resize it from the original signal, it could be like 4K, and then downscale it to HD or SD and compresses it so that you can actually see it on your, on your device. Um, uh, that is great. So we converted that entirely as pods. Um, so what Kubernetes allowed us to do here is by using the concept of pods, we've fundamentally um, reduced the kind of failure domain that we normally have. When an appliance used to be powered down for some reason, or network used to fail, then the whole appliance was out, which is like, not ideal. With pods, you can, reduce the f the, you can reduce the failure domain from it's fairly large to really, really small, a TV service, or actually a single step of transformation of a TV service. So this is really, really, ni really nice. Uh, also, what Kubernetes gives us is the, ab the ability to respin pods when they fail. Um, but now there's a little bit of problem with doing this, because if one of these pods in that red arrow, which is the, the kind of video traffic, if you want, if one of these pods dies, uh, it's actually an outage. It's actually you know, an artifact that you can visu visually see it, or your, your TV channel disappears, which is really not great. Some of our customers have uh, spent lots and lots of money to actually buy content rights for football matches and, uh, and so on, and, or movies. So it's not really not ideal. 
So uh, we can't just cope with the, um, I guess, the pod life cycle that Kubernetes gives us. So we actually have taken the same mechanism we used to use in appliances. We create what I call one plus one or n plus one or n plus m. We uh, we actually over provision really, um, and because this is real time, we have to actually synchronize lockstep the multiple encoders together to make sure that if something happens, if you want pod dies, you have to switch, then the next frame in the video is actually served in real time. So uh, we call that one plus one sync. Uh, so we actually build that on top of Kubernetes, okay? So it works quite nicely. Uh, and also what Kubernetes has given us, it gives us the ability also to uh, ingest content in multiple availability zones. So um, it's especially the case for satellite downlinks where um, uh, some of our customers are taking content from, from say the same source but ingesting that into two different locations or three different locations. That's really useful because that means we can now spread uh, multi-AZ clusters and really nice to manage with Kubernetes. Okay. Um, okay, and that's pretty much it. Oops, wrong one. So um, application deployment. So we started in that journey as a, um, I'd say, yes, as a collection of containers. Um, and so that's initially we, start, we started, we started uh, using Docker for that. Um, then we moved on to, uh, because we started, we started having a lot, lot of containers, like pretty much, I'm sure, all of you in this room. Um, we started using Helm. Um, so we started putting things like uh, uh, the functions, the parameters, uh, whether you wanted SD, HD, or 4K into charts, um, which is quite nice. Um, we also use a uh, chart museum uh, for that at the moment, or as, as part of our deployments, both on prem and in the cloud. Um, and then, of course, we started having lots and lots and lots of different combinations. Every customer has got a slightly different uh, way of working, a slightly different way of, 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 of operating the system. So we had to come up um, uh, with common solution blueprints that we could refer to and uh, effectively give to our services team, give to our, our, our solution architects, uh, be able to deal with all that stuff. Um, yeah, that's ours. And then finally, um, we've noticed a lot of our customers start to also asking the same thing. Uh, and we do the same thing in development, by the way. Um, we start having multiple environments, uh, effectively a staging, uh, a testing environment, and a production environment. Actually, in Dev, we also have development, development environments, too. Um, that's all great, um, but I think it's still in progress. So uh, we still have to do things like um, uh, what to do about upgrade, what to do about downgrades, system expansion, and that kind of stuff. So we're investigating uh, fundamentally the operator framework. You've done, probably heard about a lot of talks about, about this uh, through the course of the week. Uh, so that's the kind of things we're looking at. Um, also, good old NFS, uh, we used to use that for <laughs> developing on appliances probably 15 years ago, it's still out there. Uh, we use that today, uh, and we're trying to get rid of it, really. <laughs> it's not really um, replicated, uh, not ideal. So we're investigating multiple options for that. Um, okay, so um, now, uh, what about resource requests? So we're quite, we're quite hungry for resources. Um, these appliances that we were talking about were designed using custom chipsets, um, FPGAs, that kind of stuff. So that meant that um, because it was purpose-built, we knew exactly what they were capable of doing. If you bought a box from us, it was like 12 channels of SD or four channels of HD. That's it. You knew exactly what to have and how many feeds you had. Um, really, uh, with Kubernetes, we had to do that dynamically. So we start developing an algorithm where we were taking known configurations, um, uh, known TV channel costs, and we fed that to a machine learning algorithm. Um, that gave us the ability to uh, do a predictive cost model. So how many a TV, uh, how much a TV channel, depending on the configuration we're dealing with, uh, was actually used to process that channel. Um, and then we we try now to look at whether how to ship that model to to our customers. So I know there's multiple versions and so on to be able to do that. There's a cube flow and that kind of stuff. But um, uh, and the idea is, so this is a still work in progress, but to take a new TV channel configuration, the kind of configuration that our customers actually use because everybody tweaks slightly the setup. You know, one of the slightly different frame rate, different, slightly different bit rate. 
uh, and be able to come with a new TV channel cost and feed that back into the pod definition that we've got in our, in our pod. So we're quite surprised we had to do a lot of the legwork ourselves, by the way. So if you, you guys have some ideas about how to do this in a bit generic way, uh, when find us later. <laughs> Interested to hear what you've got to suggest. Um, um, so as um, the IT is, is, is as kind of swallowed the whole of the television world, whether it's production uh, and so on, and especially because we've broken these appliances into multiple microservices, we, we have to deal with a lot of um, the monitoring of it and the, looking at what comes out of these microservices into the video. It's actually quite a challenge um, because you can't put a person with eyes to look at what comes out of a cloud. You, you've got to actually look at it when it's there. Um, so we've had to do some, some efforts. Um, so we uh, started looking at, uh, actually we have done that already, that's already, that's already done. Uh, what you're seeing there is effectively a uh, plugin for Grafana that we built to display video thumbnails, uh, because that didn't really exist um, uh, before. Um, and effectively it's trying to make IT tools more television aware. So it's nice for IT to swallow the whole of the television ecosystem entirely. But like voice over IP, it's not going to happen without any change in either side. So we are changing, but the, IT is, the rest of IT is also going to change, I think. Um, so, uh, and for that, we started using something like uh, Elasticsearch, FluentD, and Kibana for logs. Um, and of course, Prometheus and Grafana for uh, monitoring. Uh, so we're looking at bit rate and that kind of stuff, important stuff we're doing for time. You know that. Um, so now we've done this move to, to the cloud. Um, by the way, we can do a lot more stuff with it. So um, that means we can free ourselves from the constraints we had, uh, effectively dealing with just 2D pictures and um, uh, 2D frames. We actually can do a lot more than what we used to do before, actually. So uh, this has um, uh, been developed uh, recently. We've done. Um, uh, we've actually done a few events. We've actually got um, quite a couple of uh, basketball matches on this uh, using this technology. We've um, created a, effectively a, a brand new thing, which is about live 360 video augmented experience. So this is not about replacing the, you know, the experience that you and me are used to, to watch television on the big screen. This is kind of to offer a second screen experience, okay? Uh, you're not going to wear goggles with 360 video for about a, an entire football match. I don't think it's really uh, the thing here, but it's to really provide a different viewpoint on an event. So um, we've taken content from these um, uh, 360 video cameras, which are filming, con filming at really, really high resolution. We're talking about 6K or 8K, so that's a lot of pixels to encode, right? Um, we are processing this into Google Cloud. Um, and we're sending that to various uh, displays. So that could be just basic tablet experience or what you'd find on a, uh, on a VR headset. And really, we've, we've, we've done this in partnership with many companies because this is brand new. There's a lot of, uh, a lot of interest into this. So we've partnered with Dutch Telecom with their Magenta VR app, um, Tile Media for the uh, packager and the tiling of the content, and uh, NVR for the camera and Magnum Film for the production. So um, that, that's really, really cool. That's the kind of really new cool things that we can do with these, uh, with these environments. Um, so a couple of examples of things we've done. Uh, we looked at uh, live sports. So that's the uh, Dutch Telecom uh, basketball match. If you're interested, I've got a demo after the talk. You can come and have a chat. I can show you what, what we've done. Um, and live music concerts as well. Um, it's, but you're kind of trying to give you the best seat in the house, um, right in front of the sea, uh, right in front of the, uh, um, the, um, the scene, or even next to the singer, and so on. It's quite really cool stuff. Any sports coming, coming along quite, quite impressively. Um, um, the next is well, actually, what we can, what can we do to actually use the cloud even better? So really what we've learned during that exercise, and that's something that, um, um, that really I think even me initially was like, oof, oof, it's quite a bit of a challenge, a bit of a change as well. But really what we used to do is we t used to take all this content, we're talking about 6K, 8K content, and trying to encode everything as one stateful encoder. So, uh, and that's, that, that's, that initially works quite nicely, but the problem is this doesn't really fit in a kind of the spirit of that Kubernetes actually expects from workloads. Um, 
So I know there was a talk earlier in the keynote this morning that said, you know, you, we shouldn't prohibit all stateful tasks and workloads from Kubernetes, but really, it's not really the, um, uh, not really making use of what we've got available. So, oops, again, wrong button. Uh, so we're trying to move from stateful encoders to completely stateless encoding jobs. So that means that um, rather than actually having to encode everything as one big video, we actually chop the video into tiles both specially uh, in the same frame and temporarily over time. So that means that we can now make sure that all of these tiles are actually small encode jobs, stateless encode jobs that carry their configuration, uh, their purpose, and uh, where they belong when they, you know, to be able to reconstruct them on the output. And that really, I think, is something that has really got great potentials in to actually change the world uh, how television works. Um, so, if you do have technicalities, um, port scalers, um, I think that's an interesting thing. Uh, we started using that a little bit, but the problem is port scalers are normally based on metrics like CPU consumption and so on, um, which is really isn't, I mean, we, we need really to have used custom metrics just more specific to television. So that's also an area of, of development we, we need to look at a bit further. Okay, and uh, I think that's, that's would be about it. Um, that's the end of it. So I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk. Uh, we, um, uh, just to let you know, we're also recruiting as well in many of these uh, sites that Arnold uh, was saying. Um, and uh, we hope that you will watch television a little bit differently now. All right, thank you. Do you have any questions? There's a microphone. Hi. Thanks for uh, the good presentation. Regarding this networking journey you have shown, have you looked here in the conference on the network service mesh? Because you asked for a video service mesh, because but maybe more general layer two, layer three networking could help you. Have you had an uh, initial look on this sandbox project? Yes, the answer is uh, yeah, and we, we still need to look a little bit further. Um, the, the, the way we, we track uh, we track transformation in our systems today is very, very similar to what a, to what, to what a service mesh would, would, would do. Uh, the only problem is currently for what we know, from what we've seen with service mesh is that uh, you're dealing with mainly something that's transactions. So in order for us to make, to make use of all these service mesh tools, uh, even the networking service mesh, um, is that we have to somewhat change the way the video itself is carried over the network. So currently, um, it, it is really fire and forget. Okay? You fire packets, you fire the content to the particular place, um, in most cases, not all the time, but in most cases, it's really fine and forget. So we have protocols, some of them open source, that are dealing with being able to do retries, uh, if, for example, if, if the packet's lost in transit, or if either the receiver or the sender done something wrong with the transmission. But that needs to move forward to, into the service mesh world to be able to. That's, that's one potential view. Yep makes sense to have a deeper look into network service mesh because it's not about the transactional service mesh which is in layer 7 but we are talking here about layer 2, layer 3 wi virtual wires so exactly what you need I think yeah but we'll definitely have a look definitely yeah. cool any other question then You showed, for example, uh, some Grafana plugins. Mm -hmm. Are those open source? Not yet. There's something we've done a bit of innovation projects. Is just internal tools we've done um, in order to, to get to get us going, really. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's one potentially one, one, one area we could we could actually we could really explore. Yes, because it's it's quite important and it's quite maybe, it's quite simple in the end. Maybe I can complement this. I think um, traditionally the broadcast industry and media industry is not mm. open source. There's a mindset to, it's mindset to change here, definitely. We want to get there, we want to get part of the community and so on, but there is some barriers here. So yes, we'd love to put that in open source because mm -hmm. it's just video plugins, but there's challenges here.
Be with all the standards for everything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um. Hi, uh, just a quick uh, question. Um, since you're working with live TV, I mean, I think latency is quite important to you. Uh, did that influence your choice of your container network uh, solution like, like Flannel or Weave or whatever you're using? Yeah, yes, it did. I think um, latency is quite an important uh, uh, parameter in what we do. Um, so. It is important end to end, really, but it affects different different areas of the of the of the um, of the life cycle of the content differently. So, if you're talking about, uh, say, in a sport environment, an interview, for example, that the, the latency is has got to be as low as possible. Uh, so, yes, that's 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 incredibly important. Um, we've measured different levels of, of latency with different CNI plugins. Uh, the ones that we stabilize for um, for uh, video carrying content has got the minimal number of buff minimal number of buffering. That's that. Yes, it did influence a lot. Yes. Um, so we don't want to have a necessary number of hops into into the uh, into the system. Also, uh, an important thing to know is that uh, we've noticed a lot of the uh, CNI plugins do have uh, certain CPU consumption, especially we talk about a lot of data. So that has an impact not just on latency, but also how much resource we have left to do video processing at the back of it, or audio processing at the back of it. So uh, even, though, even though we try, as I say, we're trying to move away completely from, uh, um, from dedicated hardware, in some cases when it makes sense, having some hardware acceleration or minimum buffering or some specific design that suits us is actually preferable. Um, so it's, yeah, it's about latency, buffering, and uh, an overall cost of the solution, really. Um, OK. Well, thank you much. Cheers. Thank you.